It would have been another black as pitch night if it weren't for the fires. Before they began their hasty retreat, Captain Marks instructed his men to set some of the barricades aflame. At least he was finally listening to her suggestions, Minnie thought bitterly, as she limped alongside the steady stream of soldiers down the communication trench toward the reserve line. No longer fueled by terror and the all-consuming drive to survive, she had enough room in her mind to notice her ankle had begun to throb painfully. A sprain, most likely. Probably from when she pulled it roughly out of the sucking mud, or some wrong step she took while fleeing above ground to the support trench. She hoped it was only a sprain, at least. Until they reached the reserves, she didn't have time to assess it. Even once they got there, she wasn't sure if there would be time. They had to figure out how to regain control of the situation before they lost the whole damn war. Here. Swift carefully took her arm, stooping as he draped it over his shoulders to let her shift the weight off her aching leg. Thank you. The captain and Private Chandra had been running to and fro, Mark sparking orders and Chandra relaying messages back and forth from the wireless transmitter. Swift, however, had stayed by Minnie's side. He didn't say anything for a beat. Then... It's us should be thanking you, miss. Dread squirmed in her stomach. Yes, she had gotten a few of them out alive, but at what greater cost? And she hadn't managed to even save that small handful of souls anyway. Maybe Cresswell couldn't have been helped, but Sultan? She'd pushed him forward, forced him out onto the open ground, sent him to his death. Maybe it couldn't have been avoided. If she hadn't made him act, they would have all died. But knowing that didn't help. She'd pushed him, and he hadn't made it to the other side. The two actions felt intimately connected, even if, in reality, they weren't. In light of all that, the thanks felt hollow. Thank me if we survive. They shuffled along another few steps before Swift spoke again. How'd you kill that fangy bugger anyway? She thought back to that morning, already so distant in her memory, and snorted again, this time with a bit more humor. (laughs) By making the best of a stupid mistake. Short answer, arrow to the heart. Thought it was stakes what killed vampires, he said, trying to keep his voice light. Minnie could hear the exhaustion creeping underneath anyway. She suspected that he was talking mostly to keep himself upright and alert. If that was the case... She was happy to oblige him, despite the topic of conversation being one she'd rather avoid, given the day's events. They can. Anything long and slender, like a nail or a stake, can kill them, if you can get close enough to shove it through their heart. An arrow will do the trick, if you're a good shot. Unlike her ill-timed attempt earlier, she thought ruefully. Not bullets, though. Not sure why. Magic's funny that way. Can never be simple, right? Minnie shook her head with a humorless laugh. (sighs) I suppose not. They concentrated on walking for a while. As they neared the reserve line, sounds of activity became clearer. Voices calling back and forth, boots rushing along duckboards, a trench terrier barking. The support soldiers ahead of them rallied, their trudge picking up to a more energetic gait. When they spilled into the intersection of the communication trench and reserve line, the light from the electric bulbs hung at regular intervals washed over them, illuminating clearly the injuries of earlier. Some of the soldiers from support were relatively unscathed. Others had gashes, bruises, and torn uniforms. Many saw one soldier cradling an arm to his chest that she strongly suspected was broken. Then she looked at Swift and instantly sucked the air in between her teeth in a pained hiss. Half of his face was swollen, a broad, deep welt welling up beneath his dark brown skin, and small cuts from flying debris peppered his other cheek. His own uniform was smeared with mud and rotting filth where ghouls had tried to grab him. The hand braced around her back gripped his unsheathed trench knife, and his other still held his shovel ready. Along the wooden handle, 
She could see smears of his own blood where the grain had rubbed open the flesh of his palms. From the look on his face, she didn't look much better. A shadow fell across them. Miss Damson, a word. Captain Marks led her down the trench, impatient when Minnie, still supported by Swift, lagged behind. The soldiers running up and down the line parted for them and shot them curious and fearful looks as they passed. Their destination was another bunker. They ducked inside to find a group of officers already assembled. Lieutenants, another captain, and a lieutenant colonel fixed their somber gazes on the newcomers. This is Miss Damson of the American Order of Joan and Private Swift. They witnessed what happened at the front firsthand. While the officers eyed them, Swift eased Minnie into a seat before slumping into one himself. The lieutenant colonel sent a man running for a medic, then returned his attention to the captain and asked for a report. Marx's briefing was brisk, factual, and utterly dry. Minnie barely listened as he clinically recounted details of the evening, answering questions as they arose. Sitting down seemed to signal to her body that it was safe enough to feel pain, and the simple fact was that her entire body hurt. A medic and a nurse arrived and began looking her over, whispering questions to her as they prodded her in various ways. Eventually, the nurse pressed a couple tablets of aspirin into one hand and a cup of tea into the other and urged her to drink. And then Marx was talking to her, something she only fully registered when he paused expectantly. Pardon? You know more about this magic mumbo-jumbo than anyone. How do you suggest we proceed? Minnie popped the pills in her mouth and took a long, slow sip of tea, trying to scrape her thoughts together. They'd already mortared the forward trenches, but that wouldn't have disposed of all the ghouls. The barricades would hold for a time, and some of the ghouls might catch fire from their initial encounter with such obstacles, but they wouldn't all go up in flames. There were plenty of new dead bodies to be raised besides. Eventually, the fires would die down, or enough ghouls would pile onto the barricades to bowl them over or put them out, and then they could come down the line unimpeded. The options Minnie's tired mind could generate were decidedly few and grim. Ghouls had to be dismembered, which normally meant that swords and chopping blades were the best instruments to use. But this war didn't utilize swords nearly so often as previous ones, and the bayonets and trench knives they had weren't built for hacking. Shovels, then, would be best, but the soldiers lacked the training to use them most effectively— not to mention the psychological wherewithal needed to face a walking corpse. Concussive weapons might work, as she'd considered earlier. They might be able to send some men above ground to hurl grenades into the support trenches, but that wouldn't work terribly well once they got into small arms or mortaring range, and it was too risky to have them go by way of trenches. If it were daylight, they might be able to request some aircraft. The pilots could drop grenades into the trenches from a safe distance, but again, they didn't have time to wait until morning, and pilots were trained for dogfights, not missions like this. By the time any aircraft arrived, there'd be no telling what the situation would be besides. Nor could many guess the accuracy of their aim, if they were indeed sent to drop explosives. They might miss the Allied trenches, or worse, accidentally drop bombs on top of their friends instead of the undead enemy. Fire would be best. A huge conflagration would destroy all the bodies, undead or simply dead. But short of dousing the trenches in gasoline, Minnie wasn't sure how to accomplish that. Those charms. Can you teach them to these men? Minnie shook her head. We're well past the possibility of charms being any help here, Captain. Well, there must be something you can offer. Captain. The lieutenant colonel said, a warning in his voice. There was one other option, but many didn't know much about it. Just as the Central Powers had their sorcerers, so too did the Allies. There were rumors in the Order Grapevine of sorcerers being recruited by governments and assembled into teams for specific, often unknown purposes. The Order was leery of this development, to put it mildly. Last many had heard... They were earnestly trying to uncover more information on these special programs. 
Putting a bunch of sorcerers in the same room and giving them license to work more magic with less oversight was like giving sweets to a bunch of hungry toddlers and telling them to pace themselves. It was asking for trouble, and a whole lot of belly aches, in the most benign of scenarios. There were far worse possibilities, many that didn't bear considering. Whatever the case, many couldn't deny that sorcerers could be truly helpful here. If anyone knew how to counter the magics now at work, they would. Or they could boost the efficacy of the weapons here, make blades cut as if they were sharper, or grenades explode with more force. They couldn't conjure fire from thin air, but they could encourage the spread of those already burning. Or they could turn the dead against their masters. But that magic was of the darkest kind, and many wouldn't be comforted to see it, even if it was in service to their cause. Before she could say anything, Marx interrupted her, making an obvious effort to check the frustration behind his words. When one encounters a snake, the best course of action is to cut off its head. You mentioned that sorcerers did this, yes? Yes. And they generate the energy that powers these... these ghoul creatures? Yes. He gave a single, decisive nod turning back to his commanding officer. Then it's clear what must be done, isn't it? The knight must find and kill them. Minnie couldn't stop herself. She laughed in abject disbelief. (laughs) I fail to see the humor in this. The laughter died in her chest. You must be joking. The lieutenants in the room shuffled uncomfortably. The other captain and the lieutenant colonel shared a troubled look. I assure you, I am not. Minnie shook her head. Captain, I can't. As a knight of the Order, I am explicitly forbidden from engaging in active combat against an enemy faction. My only task is to track down aberrations and offer my support. Then what good are you? You women call yourselves warriors, but when we're in a real war, you just stand back while the men do all the fighting and dying, and you call it a matter of principle. Minnie surged to her feet. A lance of pain shot up her leg, but she didn't crumple back into her seat. It just fed her explosive anger. I saved your goddamn life, you pathetic son of a bitch! And if you'd followed orders to begin with- Get her out of here! Out! Now! How dare you blame us! How dare you blame me for your stupid incompetence! Marks rounded on her, his eyes wide, teeth bared, as savage as he'd ever looked, when another voice broke through the din. Enough. The lieutenant colonel's voice was barely raised, yet it had an instantly mollifying effect on the tempers in the room. Captain Box, what you have faced tonight would rattle any man. You've done enough. Until further notice, you are relieved of duty. Marx's expression crumpled into one of anguish. Sir, I... Lieutenant Bakta, would you please see Captain Marx do a bunk? Marx didn't even look at Minnie as he passed on his way to the trench, his face totally blank and eyes distant. He disappeared through the doorway, and only then did the Lieutenant Colonel continue. Night, Damson. I am Lieutenant Colonel Hallwell. I would go on to express our gratitude for your assistance, but I don't believe we have the time to properly thank you for all you have done, and there is more yet to do. I appreciate the position you are in, but Captain Marx is correct. Eliminating the sorcerers is an option we must explore, and you are the person amongst us best equipped to do so. Minnie nodded, slumping back into her seat. I am no sorcerer, sir, but it's my understanding that the British Army may have assets better suited for this work. Hallwell stiffened. Lieutenants, leave us. Coleman, nurse, you too. Without a word, the room emptied, leaving only Hallwell, the remaining captain... Minnie and Swift. Close the door, Clark. When that was done, he swept his hat off his head and ran a hand through his thinning hair. You are correct, Knight Damson. We do have magical assets. Though how you know of their existence is something I am curious to understand. He shot her a sharp, searching look before he continued. But that is a conversation best left for another time. There are, in fact, three units in this region. However, they are shared across the whole bloody division. One unit stopped here two nights ago, though, so it is likely they are still in the area. 
I held off from contacting them until I had more actionable information. He frowned. The thing is, with these chaps, one never knows exactly where they are or how fast they can arrive. Could be an hour from now, could be two days. We can call for aid, but we cannot depend upon it being given. Minnie's heart sank precipitously in her chest. I see. We will call for them, but we must make contingencies in their absence. We will begin putting plans together here, but we cannot ignore any possible solution at this point. So, I put it to you. How can we make use of your expertise without violating your directives? How, indeed. Many tried to scrape a solution together. Permission to speak, sir. Hallwell transferred his gaze to Swift. Permission granted. Well, it's simple, isn't it? Send a sharpshooter, snuff him out. I'm your man. He rose to his feet, a little stiff. I'll kill the sorcerer. I'm a crack shot. When no one immediately replied, Swift darted Minnie a pleading look, silently asking her to back him up. Send her with me and we'll get it sorted. The three stared at him. Captain Clark finally observed, You're dead on your feet, soldier. Swift squared his shoulders. Respectfully, sir. That might be the case, but I'm not full dead yet, and I can still see well enough to shoot. For a long beat, nobody moved. Then Captain Clark cleared his throat. There's a man in my command, Private Briggs. He's our best marksman. I suggest we send him to accompany them on this mission, sir. Hallwell ran a finger over his mustache, deep in thought. Night, Damson. Minnie could see about a dozen holes in the plan, but she supposed it was better than no plan. It's settled, then. Hallwell didn't look pleased, and she was sure he would have rathered something more sound, but he was well aware of the stakes. They were at that desperate hour, where all resources must be expended in the hopes that something would work. The discussion shifted briefly to how to outfit them and when they should leave. The general consensus was that right now wouldn't be soon enough. Before they exited the dugout, Minnie saw Hallwell withdraw a red envelope from his breast pocket. Bring me a rat, he told Clark, just as she and Swift stepped out into the cold black night. Above their heads, ugly, ruddy light painted the undersides of the smoke clouds drifting out of the support trenches to their east. Another flurry of activity had commenced. Someone had sent for Private Briggs, and another runner had been tasked with finding Swift a good rifle. The nurse from earlier, an older, matronly type, had been waiting outside to finish rendering care to Minnie. She guided her over to a bench carved into the trench wall, muttering curses under her breath the whole while, and set to work wrapping Minnie's ankle tighter with gauze. The aspirin was working to dull the pain, but it wasn't gone. Minnie glanced over at Swift. The doctor was cleaning his hands, the grimace on his face a twin to the nurse's. Bloody terrible idea, you going anywhere but a bed, the nurse announced as she tied off the bandage. She fixed Minnie with a baleful eye. Fools, the lot of them. I thought you'd have more sense in your head. Minnie smiled sadly. I'm afraid it's all been knocked out at this point. The nurse snorted before straightening and touching Minnie's cheek. God keep you, girl. And try not to break your ankle while you're out on this mad errand. Or get shot. Once the doctor and nurse were gone, Minnie sighed. (sighs) What use exactly do you think I'll be on this mission? She shrugged her haversack and her quiver and bow from her shoulders, and began inspecting each. Sorcerers don't have witches' marks or brands on their faces, you know. And I haven't heard of any pointy hats or special uniforms, either. There's no good way to tell them apart from anyone else. Swift considered her, his swollen eye narrowed to a slit, his other roaming over her face, appraising. You Joan types, you know a thing or two about magic, yeah? Minnie frowned. They did, technically. They had to know the basic principles, at least, to be able to do their job. But the Order preferred that its knights use magical tools over outright spellcasting. Something about physical intermediaries being safer and more predictable to handle in the field. Minnie's own training had been greatly abbreviated. 
Thus, the emphasis of her training had been on martial skill, warding, and handling the most bellicose supernatural threats. The finer aspects of magic and its many theories were not emphasized, a controversial choice that many of the older knights had lamented, if not outright decried as dangerous. She didn't like where this was heading. Some, not as much as I'd like. He shrugged. Still more than any of us, most like. Gotta be something you can do. She started to protest, to say that it didn't work that way, or at least shouldn't, but a soldier who had been trotting up the line drew to an abrupt halt between them, his breath puffing great clouds into the cold night air. Private Briggs, he said by way of greeting. He had run into the other messenger before finding them, apparently. From around one shoulder, he shrugged a rifle and held it out to Swift. His own was braced against his opposite. Shall we head out, then? Minnie and Swift regarded him dubiously. He was a husky fellow, on the short side of average, with a roundness to his cheeks that spoke to a youth yet to be fully shed, and a crack in his voice that confirmed it. A volunteer, then, little more than a boy. Does your mummy know you're out? Swift said, taking the offered long arm. The kid seemed entirely unfazed. Har har. Never heard that before. Also heard there's witches need hunting, so might the jokes wait. Minnie glanced at the pack in her lap. You wouldn't happen to know anyone who could keep their eyes on and hands off this, would you, Private? Oi! He grabbed the arm of a passing soldier. Oi! Take this lady's pack to Grisham, and don't go snooping. She's probably got all kinds of lady things in there for her monthlies, yeah? Minnie laughed when the young man took her haversack gingerly between his hands and hurried off with a look of consternation on his face. That left her with her quiver, dagger, and unstrung bow once more, as light a load as she'd carried with her when she'd set out to hunt the vampire little more than 24 hours ago. Not that they'd be much use to her now, but there was no way in hell she was leaving her most precious possessions behind. And it was better to be prepared than not. All right. She heaved herself to her feet and tested her weight on her ankle. The extra support was helping. Let's get moving. As she swung her quiver up over her shoulder, she caught sight of a gray shape darting out of the dugout doorway. A rat, Minnie realized, as it scampered along close to the earthen trench wall. Nothing unusual about that, except for a flash of white around its throat and an oddness about its gait. There was a scrap of paper secured around its neck by a length of twine, she saw, and it paused to paw at the cord in agitation. Before she could step closer, a black cat surged from the shadow beneath the bench where she had just been sitting. It pounced on the rodent with predatory precision, and with one deft movement, snapped the rodent's neck between its jaws. Then it turned its luminous golden eyes to Minnie. A shiver shot down her spine. She didn't like how it looked immediately at her, as if it knew she was watching. But before she could wonder any further about it, the cat disappeared, gone between one blink of her eyes and the next. Miss? Private Briggs and Swift had already started on their way. You need help with something? Minnie started. No. Her gaze lingered for a moment longer, on where she could have sworn she had just seen a cat. But that wasn't right. Soldiers kept trench terriers, not trench cats. She must have imagined it. She shook her head, refocusing her attention to the mission at hand. I'm fine. Let's go.